All right, so let's get started with this pre-recorded lecture that gets us started on beam deflections. So this is going to be the first of a two-part lecture on beam deflections. And what I want to do in this lecture, it's actually going to be pretty short because I know that this one was one of the ones I'm asking you to sort of watch uh, between now and when we uh, uh, get back after, not just after spring break, but after exam two. So this isn't going to be relevant until class on March 29th. So because I only want you to watch it um, just sometime between now and then, I'm going to try and make it short. Um, and, and what we're going to do is cover a lot of the background material related to beam deflections. Um, so there's nothing uh, between now and exam two that this uh, that this lecture is going to rely upon. Uh, but it is going to be important after the exam. So as long as you watch it between now and then, uh, you're good. Uh, in terms of some classroom logistics, so first off, uh, I had to re-record lecture 17 because I had lost that recording. So I recorded that and I posted that uh, today. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and record this. Uh, this was supposed to be recorded on March 10th. And my apologies that I didn't get, re get it recorded until then. Just had a lot of stuff uh, come up between now and then. But I finally got some time to, uh, uh, to record this. I have assigned a homework on beam deflections, but it is not due until the end of the month. It's not due until March 31st, so there's plenty of time on that. And there's only one problem, and I'd argue that problem is much easier than the one that we're going to do in class on the 29th when we discuss uh, beam deflections. I'm going to try and do two problems in class on beam deflections. So the idea behind this lecture is to cover all of the, uh, the associated background material. So let's get into it. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to talk about um, beam deflections. And I, I want to forewarn you that there's going to be some calculus uh, that, that uh, we deal with. Um, I, I'd say that the calculus is very simple. Uh, I don't think we have any complicated uh, uh, integrals or derivatives uh, to deal with. But I'll tell you that it is going to feel like alphabet soup. Um, there's going to be a lot of symbols, a lot of variables that get tossed around. Um, and uh, you're going to see a lot of like, you know, WL squared over EI. And there's and, and it's a lot of like constants and variables that you're going to have to deal with. It's not difficult, but I am going to tell you that um, that it is showing up. Um, this is a course in introductory mechanics of materials. So I'm not expecting that we deal with the most complicated beam deflection uh, challenges that one could experience. Um, for the civil engineers that are in the class, um, we have a course uh, dedicated to things like this. We have structural analysis. And in that course, we cover a lot of the other methods that you can use to compute beam deflection, such as virtual work and, and, uh, and things like that. And so mainly what I'm interested in this course uh, in doing is, is covering probably the most uh, uh, fundamental means of computing beam deflections, which is to use the direct integration method, or sometimes called double integration. Um, but in order to do that, I kind of have to set the stage for beam deflections in general um, so that you understand the equations that we're using and, and why we're doing what we're doing. But there is a little bit of a math preliminary into, um, uh, in, into assessing this. So I want to talk about some of those math preliminaries first. Uh, and so I'm starting basic here. Uh, but I want to start with the area under the curve, make sure that we all know that uh, if I have some function x that's bound between a and b, uh, that if I integrate that function, I am generating the area under the curve. And so with shorthand, we might call that, you know, some, some dA, uh, integral of dA summed up over some region. Um, one of the things that I do want to mention here is that if we look at this integral, um, uh, so we're going to use this to define moments of area, but one of the things that I want to make sure that everybody remembers from Calc 1 is that what we're performing is what is called, not, not just an integral, but we're performing what's called a definite integral. And so a definite integral has defined limits from A to B. Uh, and whenever you evaluate a definite integral, you get a, a constant, a number. The integral from a to, uh, if I have the integral of x squared and it is evaluated from 2 to 3, I'm going to get a number. I'm going to get some value. Whereas if I take the integral of just x squared with respect to x, I'm going to get some function, you know, x cubed over 3 plus c. Remember that whole arbitrary constant of integration that shows up uh, whenever you perform indefinite integration? That is going to show up. Uh, again, so plus C definitely matters uh, for the method that we're about to describe here in a little bit. Um, but um, 
but I, I, we're getting a little ahead of, ahead of ourselves when we talk about you know constants of integration and things like that. But I do want you to just keep some of these math preliminaries uh, in the back of your head. Now, if we're talking about definite integrals and we're talking about the integral of a function from A to B, uh, that's the area of the function. And we can also use this notation to define some moments of area. So for example, um, if I have the integral of dA as the area, I can take the integral of say x dA or the integral of y dA and develop moments of area. And we've actually seen this notation before. We've seen Q show up when we're looking at shear stresses and that's the first moment of area. Uh, the second moment of area, which we know is the uh, area moment of inertia or the moment of inertia would be the integral of that distance squared. So the integral of y squared dA or the integral of x squared dA. Uh, and the main reason I show you this is so that when we get into the derivation and you see me just sort of replace, you know, let's say the integral of y squared dA with just ix, like why'd you do that? Well, that's that's what our, our definition is. And by now, I, I kind of think this stuff in here is kind of old hat, like we know um, what the moment of inertia is, we know what the first moment of area is, but I just want to set the stage to make sure that we're all on the same page with some of these um, uh, uh, expressions. Now, uh, I want to talk about one other thing, which is the curvature of a function. And this one I'm expecting that you probably don't remember, and that's completely okay. I guarantee you, if you pull your calculus textbook from, from your bookshelf and go to the index and look for the curvature, it, it's there. It is possible that the curvature uh, uh, function might have been skipped in a given math class, and that's fine. Um, it's a very plug and chug expression, but I do want you to kind of see it. So let me sort of set the stage. So if I have some function f of x, and let's say I take the derivative of that function, I will get the slope of that function, right? So the derivative of f of x or f prime of x will tell you the slope of that function, right? And if I take, let's say, the derivative again, uh, the f double prime of x or the second derivative of that function, that will give me the concavity of that function. And I think that most engineering students are familiar with, you know, second derivative tests or, you know, slope of function, concavity of function, because there's a, a main uh, sort of application that you lead to in, in calculus lane, which is how to graph a function. So you can graph it, you can determine the slopes, the concavities to determine, you know, what the, and intercepts and all that stuff to determine what the, the function looks like. Um, but there is another property of a function called its curvature, which is uh, computed looking, uh, and it looks like this. You take the second derivative uh, and divide it by this quantity, uh, one plus the first derivative squared all raised to the three halves. And I fully expect you, you might not remember that. That's okay. I promise you it's in your, in, in your calculus textbook. Um, but it's there. And oh, I, I am violating, I guess, what is it? Um, Twitch rule 101, I need to take my camera and move it up here so that everybody can see that. Um, so note that we also have the, uh, the, um, the, so the curvature of a function, I'm using this Greek letter kappa, uh, but we can relate the curvature of a function to the radius of curvature by just inverting, right? So if the curvature is kappa, one over, uh, uh, one over that is rho, and that's just the radius of curvature. Okay, putting my camera back. Okay, so let's get back to the slideshow. Okay, so slope, curve, concavity, and curvature. Okay, so now we can start talking about beam deflection. So um, the unlike um, if we're talking about axially loaded uh, uh, elements, the you know the, the the mechanics are a little different. But I'm, what I mean by axially loaded elements is that the deflection was sort of easy to determine for um, for axially loaded elements. Right, we have a um, uh, a bar. Uh, we yank on it with some load p. It has some cross sectional area a. We know the Young's modulus is E. We know how long it is. So we can take deflection equals PL over EA. So basically, we're just taking stress equals strain, putting P over A for stress, delta over L for strain, solving. Like, it's pretty simple. But for beams, the mechanics are a little different. Um, the assumptions, however, are largely identical. So we assume that the behavior is linear. We assume that the behavior is elastic. So we don't have any yielding, any permanent deformations, any of that stuff to consider. And we can get into that world with, with beams and really with anything that we're talking about here. But again, as we've talked about in this class, more often than not, we try and limit our engineering systems to linear behavior anyway. So uh, in that regard, we're gonna keep you know, uh, linear assumptions here as well. Um, another big one is that we consider deflections small when compared to their original member length. So we take, let's say you have a beam, you put load on it, it deflects. 
but we don't consider those deflections appreciable enough to start changing the equilibrium of, of the, the structure. In other words, the deflections are, are small enough that they wouldn't affect our reactions or internal forces in the member and so on and so forth. And again, more often than not, very true in, in the real world. There are some instances where we have to consider second order effects and large deflection theory, and, and there, are, there are some applications for that. But for most uh, engineering applications, we don't need to worry about it. Um, so we, we won't have to go back and like refigure out equilibrium when the structure's uh, uh, deformed. Okay, so um, now what I'm doing here is I'm zooming into a deflected portion. And again, here I am. Let me move that up here. So I'm zooming into a deflected portion of the beam and it's kind of like exaggerated, like it's it's like going, you know, it's this huge deformed, uh, 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 huge amount of deformation. But I'm doing that just so that we can kind of see what's going on in terms of the uh, the geometry. So what we have here is a, is a segment of a beam that is deflected, okay? And if we look at some of the geometry, so for example, if we look at where the coordinate system lies, so the origin O, you can see that right here, uh, let me, Put my little laser pointer on here. Um, let's see. There we go. So here's my laser pointer. Okay. So here's the um, the coordinate system, and if you see this solid sort of curved line right here, that solid line is the centroid. Okay. And so that's the 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 centroid, the neutral axis of the beam after it has been deformed. And so what I'm proposing is that if the beam was, I don't know three feet long or, or seven meters long before uh, it was uh, before load was applied after load is applied that solid line is still three feet long or seven meters long however long the original uh, beam length was so that's what the solid line is this dashed line is anything away from the neutral axis now we know from bending stresses that when you get past the neutral axis you start getting bending stresses right well it stands to reason that if you have zero bending stress at the neutral axis, you have zero deformation at the neutral axis. Just like once you get past the neutral axis and you do get bending stresses, you do get deformations as well. So that's the same assumption we're gonna carry on here. So if I look at, so so now we need to start applying some, some data. Now, oops, drop this here. Now we need to start applying some, some, some data. We need to start applying some expressions to try and categorize what's going on here. Now, let's start off with the length. Okay. Now, if you remember from geometry, the length of a circular sector, this circular arc here, can be expressed by the radius times this angle, right? And so, like, if the angle was 360 degrees or 2 pi radians, you get 2 pi times the radius, and that's the circumference. So, you know, not anything very uh, 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 off the mark there. So, we'll call that L initial. That's the initial length, okay? The f everywhere else along the depth, the length changes, and so that's the dashed line. So if we call that the final length, the final length is again radius times angle, but now we have a new radius. Instead of this, this value rho, we're going to use this uh, radius, which is rho minus this term y, and y is however far away we are from the centroid. So now we have an initial length, and we have a final length. Well, if we remember, how do we define strain if we have a final length and an initial length? Well, the difference in those two will give you the change in length. And if we take the change in length over the original length, that gives us the strain. So I'm going to do a little bit of alphabet soup here in a second, but that's where I'm getting at is change in length over original length. So what do we got? Strain is change in length over the original length. The original length is L initial. The uh, uh, change in length is L final minus L initial. So here's what I'm doing. I'm taking this pile of junk minus this pile of junk and notice how the rho times theta, notice how they will cancel if I take this minus that. And so I'm left with negative y uh, theta over rho theta, and so the thetas cancel and I get negative y over rho. So negative y over rho is the strain. And remember, rho is the radius, and in this case, it's going to be the radius of curvature. So you can see why I, I mentioned that curvature term here in a little, uh, here earlier. Now, let me go back to my camera here. Let's see if I can, uh, See if I can get my camera back to originally where it was. Okay, now finally what I can do is if I have strain, I can take strain, multiply it by Young's modulus to get stress. And now I've got this term here. I've got stress equals E times Y over rho. And it's negative because of the, uh, the sign convention that we've adopted. But the 
Big thing I want you to keep in mind is that I have stress equals negative e times y over rho. But I already have a, an expression for stress, right? So this is what our stress profile looks like if we're uh, talking about uh, a beam, right? We take the force in each element dA. Uh, uh, so the, the force in each element dA is that area times that stress sigma. So sigma dA is the force in each element. We multiply it by some moment arm y. We then integrate that over the, uh, 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 over the cross section to determine the total amount of moment in the cross section. Uh, the negative just comes from our sign convention. So we have like smiley face positive uh, bending moments. So that, that negative is thrown in there just to uh, adhere to our appropriate sign conventions. Uh, we use our previously defined term for stress, which we just got a little bit ago. Uh, negative e times y over rho, so that comes from this right here. So we have this term for, for stress. We've got that. Set that equal to negative e times y over rho. Plug and chug. And what do we get here? We get e over rho times this hullabaloo squared right here. So we have e over rho times this integral. Well, that integral is just the moment of inertia. We should recognize that. So, oh, there's my camera getting in the way again. Let me, maybe I should just leave it up here for now. Uh, we'll see, we'll see if that, how that does for us. But yeah, this integral right here is just our moment of inertia. So now I can rewrite this as m equals e times i over rho. And then all I do is do a little bit more alphabet soup. Uh, m equals e i over rho. Rewrite that as my, my curvature expression, and now I get what's called a moment curvature relationship. But, but here's the thing, if you remember earlier in my uh, discussion of assumptions, one of the things I said was that um, we're dealing with small deflections. So the deflections aren't big enough to change the, the, the overall geometry. Well, here's our expression for, um, for, for beam deflection, right? And so I have, or for, for curvature, sorry, for curvature. And I have kappa equals the second derivative of deflection divided by this, okay? So let's look at this. I have on the bottom, I have a first derivative. I have v prime of x. That's the deflection. Um, and if I take the first derivative, which again, we're talking about small deflections. So the first derivative is a small number. If I take that number and square it, I get a really small number. And so one plus a really small number squared all raised to the 3 half power. That is probably really, really, really close to 1. So much so that instead of curvature being this really nasty derivative, we're just going to say the curvature is the second derivative. Um, so now we have a very, very basic equation for a deflection. One of the most fundamental equations in all of mechanics is that the second derivative of deflection is m over e i. And whether you express the deflection in terms of v or y, to, to be frank with you, I might be a little interchangeable with that as we're talking about beam deflections. But the um, the um, whether you express it in v or y, the fact the, the the expression or the relationship that the second derivative of deflection is m over ei is one of the most fundamental equations in all of engineering mechanics. It is so foundational to everything that uh, we do in, in structural mechanics. I, I, I can't speak to it uh, enough. Um, and so our goal is going to be to solve this equation, which is a differential equation. So if you're ever wondering why the heck you're taking differential equations, it's because we use differential equations to model systems such as engineering systems, beams being one of them. So this is this is very, very fundamental. Now, how do we, um, how do we deal with this? So we, we have a, um, let me I hope I don't have to reset my camera again. We'll, we'll see. But how do we deal with this? So we, um, we have this uh, uh, differential equation uh, that relates deflections to applied bending moments and, and stiffness and so on and so forth. But we have to solve it. Um, one of the, uh, the, the aspects of, of, of engineering and math and science is, you know, there, there's one end that's just forming the differential equations and then there's another end of it that's solving them. So how do we solve it? And to be clear, this, there's oodles and oodles of different methods that you can use to determine deflections on beams and they all in one way, shape or form are, are revolved around trying to come up with a solution to this differential equation. Um, 
And what we're going to do in this course is focus on arguably the most basic means of solving this differential equation, which is called direct integration or double integration. There are other methods for solving uh, uh, for beam deflections. And where they come in value is when your loading gets more complicated, that sometimes actually just doing all the algebra gets so involved that maybe there are more effective ways of doing it. Um, I don't want this to be a course in structural analysis because that's not what it is. We have other stuff we need to talk about. And for those students that, that need that area of expertise, we have a course dedicated to that. For those that don't, we need to cover the, 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 the fundamentals and then we can sort of move on. So I want to I wanna focus really on um, direct integration as well as understanding how to apply pre-derived formulas. And we'll talk about that when you come back uh, after your second exam. But let's talk about the method of double integration. So this is a differential equation for beam deflection. And let's say, and, and again, like I said, I interchange my B's and Y's, but it doesn't really matter in terms of the, uh, uh, the discussion here. So let's say this is my, my, uh, my equation, or my differential equation. So I have the second derivative of Y is M over EI, and I want to solve for Y. Well, one very, very easy way of solving for I or solving for what? Solving for the deflection. Why? I said I, but I meant why. One easy way of solving for the deflection is to just integrate it twice. So that's the the the, the method of direct integration is just to take m over ei and just integrate it twice. Um, that'll work. Um, now it becomes burdensome when the load uh, uh, patterns get more um, more involved. And there are other geometric approaches and energy-based approaches that handle some, some things a, a little more effectively. But for basic loading situations, I think this works uh, uh, pretty, pretty well. Um, so uh, we're going to solve for um, deflections utilizing this approach in, in this class. Now, um, Earlier in the lecture, I talked about indefinite uh, versus definite integration. And if you remember, definite integrals will give you a constant result, but indefinite integrals will not. If, remember, uh, if you evaluate an indefinite integral, you get that arbitrary constant, that plus C at the end of the day. I'm going to move my camera up just in case. I feel like I might have to keep moving my camera up and down in this lecture. So, okay. Let's look at what happens. So let's go back to, to um, basic calc one, okay? So if I have some function and I, and I integrate it, I'm gonna get another function plus some constant, right? The integral of a pile of junk is another pile of junk plus C. Now I'm calling it C1 for a reason, okay? I, I'm calling it C1 because this is the method of double integration. And so I'm going to get some pile, of, uh, I'm going to integrate some function and get a pile of junk plus C1, but then I'm going to integrate that response again. And so I'm going to get, so let's follow along with this. Let's take our time with it. So if I have some function f of x and I integrate it, I'm going to get some new function g of x plus a constant. And so what happens when I integrate the, that result, g of x plus c1? So if I integrate that, I'm going to get, let's follow along. So I've got this, cons, this, this function g of x. Whatever that is, whatever that is, when I integrate that, I'm going to get h of x. All right? But then I've got c1. What's the integral of c1? It's c1 times x. And then there is a, another constant of integration. So that's why I have c1 and c2. So these problems are going to yield two arbitrary constants of integration um, and we're going to have to figure those out because if, if I have a beam in a building or a car or an airplane or what have you, um, I need to determine those deflections. Those deflections are real. They are not arbitrary. You know, I apply load, it deflects one inch, three millimeters, whatever, whatever it does. Um, those constants of integration, those plus C's, the C1's and C2's, we solve for those using boundary conditions. What do I mean by boundary conditions? I mean these, okay? So boundary conditions result from the support conditions, okay? And really in most uh, uh, basic uh, engineering analyses, we're dealing with either simple supports or fixed supports. And by simple supports, I mean either pins or rollers. And in a lot of uh, de beam deflection problems, you can kind of treat pins and rollers the same because before, I think, uh, uh, and this might be a little bit of a, a thought 
process change. But before, when we were looking at rollers and pins and fixed supports, we were thinking in terms of unknown reactions. Like a roller has one unknown reaction, a pin support has two unknown reactions, and then a fixed support has three. But now I want you to think about it in terms of deflections. So when we look at a roller, um, it will allow it will allow rotation, but it will not allow deflection. So think if I have you know a beam supported right here, and I apply load, and that beam sort of def deflects like this, the beam will be allowed to rotate. It will have a slope, but it will not have a um, a deformation. So from a um, from a calculus perspective, if you want, you can say that like y of x is zero but y prime of x is not zero. Like it has a slope, it just doesn't have a deflection. So whenever you're dealing with simple supports, the deflection has to be zero. Whenever you're dealing with a fixed support, not only is the deflection zero, but the slope is zero as well, because right here at this uh, fixed support, it has a, a horizontal slope, it has zero slope. So um, whenever we're dealing with cantilever beams, the way that we solve for our arbitrary unknown constants is gonna be a little different than how we deal with um, uh, uh, simply supported beams. Uh, and so that's what I meant when I said when we come back from break we're going to try and have two problems. One of them being a uh, simply supported structure, one of them being a cantilever structure so we can show you how to deal with both. And I think that if you can handle the homework problems or the, the lecture problems, you can definitely handle the homework problem I'm going to give you on this. So let's see. Let me go here. Okay. The final thing I want to talk about is dimensional considerations and I think for this, maybe I should get my camera back to where it needs to be. Um, let's look at the dimensional considerations. I'm focusing on USCS units. I actually, I thought about coming up with conversion factors for SI units. I actually don't want to. I kind of think that you should see if you can do that yourself. Um, because I know we've had a lot of discussion about units in the class and, and this isn't all that difficult, but um, I want to show you where some challenges can be in regards to to, um, uh, to to US versus SI units when you're looking at beam deflections. And this goes into what we're gonna talk about during our exam review, that you're gonna be dealing with problems that are inconsistent, or with, that are dealing with inconsistent units, like beam lengths are in feet and you want deflections in inches, that's going to happen. And so uh, dealing with that is actually not all that difficult as long as you're following things uh, along. Now, before we jump into some uh, 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 some examples, I want to look at how the units play out for beams. And I'm going to try and use the differential equation for, for beam deflection to kind of show you what happens. Okay, So let's start off with the differential equation for deflection. So the second derivative of deflection is m over ei. Now if I integrate that, right, uh, and if I integrate m over ei. Let's just say that m over ei is all a constant and I integrate that, I'm going to get moment times x over ei. I'm going to have an x term in there. Uh, so from a units perspective, if I integrate that, I'm going to get like one more length unit in the answer. Like the function might be involved or, or um, you know, much longer than like m of ml over ei, but in terms of units, whatever the units are going to be, there's going to be one more length unit um, in my answer. And if I integrate again, I'm going to have ml squared over ei. So from a units perspective, I'm going to have moment times length squared over ei. Now let's let's see what that means for typical USCS units. And and I like to focus on USCS units because one. Uh, I know that beam deflection is probably, um, at least for the civil engineers in the room, you're going to have this a lot. You're, you're going to deal with much more complicated problems you know, later on in structural analysis, although we have some more um, refined and effective methods for dealing with it. But also, if you can handle USCS units, you can handle SI. SI is actually a, a little e easier to deal with in this arena as well. Um, but let's talk about the units that we typically use in, in structural analysis for um, uh, for beams. So typically our forces tend to be in kips, our lengths tend to be in feet, our member length. So we have a beam that's 40 foot long that has so many kips on it. But then our, so to be clear, our distributed loads are in kips per foot and our moments are in foot, time, foot kips, foot times kips. Um, but our moduli of elasticity are in KSI and our moments of inertia are in inches to the fourth. So if you start 
plugging this in for your your slopes and you start evaluating this for your deflections and and yeah, all I'm doing here is just carrying out the units and canceling out terms you get something here at the end that doesn't make sense like you have deflections so if I just plug and chug these values I'm gonna get deflections in foot cubed per square inches that doesn't that doesn't mean anything if I have a beam in a building I want to know how much is it deflecting four inches not seven foot cubed per square inches I want inches at the end of the day or rotations like what is foot squared per inch squared what does that mean that doesn't mean anything I need an answer I need something I can deal with okay so we have we need to ensure that our answers are usable okay and um, what we're going to do is we're going to use unit conversions okay now um, for beam deflections there are some traditional ways of dealing with this and um, one of the the simplest ways is to actually use conversion factors um, if you use typical USCS units for for um, for, for beams like member lengths and feet uh, 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 moments of inertia and inches to the fourth forces and kips etc you can actually derive conversion factors that you can use for any beam deflection problem and they're actually very very handy uh, and we'll we'll show you this uh, in class uh, on on the uh, the 29th um, but we have to derive these conversion factors and let me sort of show you how it works so the first thing you need is you need to know what your desired um, uh, units need you want at the end of the day so for USCS units what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I want my displacements in inches but in terms of the slopes or the, the how much the beams are inclined and whatnot I'm going to use um, degrees for that uh, so you could just leave the units off and just you know I guess think of it in radians but slopes for beam deflections actually tend to be pretty small and degrees tend to be a very useful means of expressing your deflection so we're going to use degrees for, for, for beam slopes or rotations. By the way, if I use the term slopes and rotations, those are interchangeable. Those kind of mean the same thing. So therefore, what you can do is for slopes and rotations and for displacements, let's look at the displacements. Man, I'm having to move this camera. Let's look at displacements. So for displacements, um, I remember I said I had foot cubed per inch squared. What I need to do is incorporate a conversion factor for um, for displacements you know there's 12 inches per foot but I have to do it three times because I've got foot cubed so I'm doing 12 inches per foot 12 inches per foot 12 inches per foot and so if you take 12 times 12 times 12 you get 12 times 12 which is 144 times another 12 which is 1728 and so you get 1728 cubic inches per cubic foot and so this term 1728 is kind of a magic conversion factor that if I use typical units for beam deflections and I multiply my answer by 1728 I will magically get the answer uh, in inches and and I say magically but it's really not magic it's me taking the units that I normally use plugging them in seeing where the inconsistencies are having a target outcome and just doing the unit conversions necessary to get that outcome and so that's what we do for displacements. Now for rotations, what happens with rotations is we don't need three conversion factors. We only need two. But then there's this means of converting radians to degrees. So we have a 180 degrees over pi radians. So when we chug that um, uh, displacement out, see, I knew I should have left my uh, camera here at the bottom. So whenever we chug that out, we find that we have a... Um, uh, a, a we have our 144 but then we also have a 180 over pi that we throw in there so we can get our answers from uh, radians into degrees and so it makes it a little easier to deal with so the idea is if I have a beam let's say I have a beam and it's deflecting you know this is rotated at a slope of seven degrees or whatnot and if you leave it in radians you'll get the I mean the answer will be right it's just sometimes the values are very very small so again that's why I think degrees are a little more usable and I think it's a little worth it to throw in that 180 over pi there Okay, um, that's it. That's really all I wanted to cover. And, and, and if there's really big takeaways I want you to, to, to keep in mind from the, the lecture, it's probably this stuff here at the end. So let me go back a few slides. So um, make sure that you, that you understand this stuff, that um, as you um, integrate indefinitely, sorry, as you integrate indefinitely, you are going to get... Um, 
unknown arbitrary constants of integration that you are going to have to deal with using boundary conditions. Understanding that for simple supports, the deflection is zero, and that for fixed supports, the deflection and the slope is zero. If you understand that, then you're good. And finally, if you understand the, um, the unit conversion factors to get for typical USCS units to get uh, deflections uh, into usable units uh, and rotations into usable units, you'll be good. Probably in this class we'll use the deflection conversion factor most, um, but uh, we may use the, the rotation one as well in our in our uh, in class examples. My my main uh, focus for our class examples on on Tuesday is to get through on the 29th is to get through more applications. I want to go through a simply supported beam and a fixed supported beam. The unit conversion stuff is just tacked on at the very end. If you can use one, you can use the other. It's really not that difficult. Uh, and that'll become clear as we do our examples uh, Tuesday morning. So with that, that's all I got. I hope you all have a wonderful spring break and we will see you when you return.